Welcome to UCSB Arts and Lectures. Please take this moment to locate the emergency exit nearest your seat. We ask that you turn off your cell phones. Please refrain from all cell phone use. We also remind you that photography and sound recording of any sort are not permitted and that food and beverages are not allowed in the theater. Thank you for coming and enjoy the event. Good evening. Welcome to Campbell Hall. I'm Heather Silva, the programming manager here at UCSB Arts and Lectures. Thank you so much for being here tonight. We're delighted that you could join us for this evening's lecture by our esteemed UC Berkeley colleague, Dr. Jennifer Doudna. Before we begin, I do want to thank tonight's event sponsors, Monica and Timothy Babich. Thank you so much. And thanks as always to our corporate season sponsor, Sage Publishing, our community partners, the Natalie Orfila Foundation and Lou Buglioli, and to Yardi for their support of our lecture program. Thank you very much. I also want to acknowledge the many UCSB students who are here with us tonight. Woo! It's always a great joy to have your energy in the room. And also to those students who are watching the live feed nearby in Buchanan Hall. So tonight's event is part of the thematic learning initiative series entitled Health Matters. In the lead up to Dr. Downda's event, Arts and Lectures organized a number of advanced learning opportunities for the community and UCSB students, including a learning opportunity about the basics of the CRISPR technology with UCSB professor of biochemistry, Dr. Stuart Feinstein at the Santa Barbara Public Library. And earlier this afternoon, Dr. Doudna attended a session with students and faculty from the Department of Molecular, Cellular, and Developmental Biology. We're most grateful to Linda Wyman and Bruce Haven for their visionary support of the ANL Thematic Learning Initiative. After Dr. Doudna's presentation, there will be a question and answer session moderated by Dr. Feinstein, which include questions collected in advance via email from ticket buyers here in the theater. Following that, Dr. Doudna will sign copies of her book here on stage called A Crack in Creation. Books are also available in the lobby at the Chaucer's book sale table. As an internationally renowned professor of chemistry and molecular and cell biology at UC Berkeley, Dr. Jennifer Doudna and her colleagues rocked the research world in 2012 by first describing a simple way of editing the DNA of any organism using an RNA-guided protein found in bacteria. This breakthrough technology called CRISPR-Cas9 has redefined the possibilities for human and non-human applications of gene editing, including opening up and accelerating the development of new genetic surgeries to cure disease, novel ways to care for the environment, and nutritious foods for a growing global population challenged by climate change. Dr. Doudna is also the executive director of the Innovative Genomics Institute, an investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Medicine, the National Academy of Inventors, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She is also a foreign member of the Royal Society and has received many other honors, including the Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences, the Heineken Prize, the BBVA Foundation Frontiers of Knowledge Award, the Japan Prize, and the Kavli Prize. She is a co-author with Sam Sternberg of A Crack in Creation, a personal account of her research and the societal and ethical implications of gene editing. It is my pleasure to welcome to the stage Dr. Jennifer Doudna. All right, thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Santa Barbara and UCSB. It's a huge honor for me to be here, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to come and, and visit with, with you and speak with you about the science that I've been up to. How are you all tonight? <laughs> Woo! 
So, um, you know, I'm really grateful for that, that generous introduction, but I always like to start, I know we have a lot of students here tonight, I like to start by pointing out that you know, I grew up in a small town in Hawaii, nobody in my family was a scientist, and I'm here really today and tonight uh, doing what I do because of uh, just, you know, pursuit of, of a passion that I had starting when I was growing up on that island environment and interested in science and thinking about how I could eventually make a career out of the process of discovery. And the story that I'm going to tell you tonight is very much an outgrowth of that passion and the interest that we had in understanding something seemingly esoteric, namely a bacterial immune system, and how that curiosity-driven science went in a direction that none of us at the beginning could have predicted. And I like to start off talking about uh, the concept of gene editing by uh, showing you this picture of the DNA double helix. And I think the idea of genome editing really started when scientists back in the 1950s discovered this beautiful structure because this chemical uh, helix is the code of life. It's the way that all cells and organisms have the chemical information to develop and grow into a tissue or an entire organism. And it's, it's, it, we can think about it really as the, the instructions for that organism. And when this double helical structure was discovered, scientists at that point already started imagining what you could do if you could not only read the code of life, but what if you could synthesize it? What if you could recode that information, alter it so that you could understand the function of genes and even do things like cure the genetic basis of disease? And, uh, and so really since, you know, since, since that time, over the last several decades, there have been a, a, a series of scientists and, and research teams that have been investigating this structure and how you could modify it. And uh, one of those wasn't me, actually, right? So we started off working in a very different area of, of biology and chemistry that eventually led us to the concept of genome editing based on our work on this obscure uh, bacterial immune system. But before we get to that, I wanted to first tell you a little bit about how I got uh, interested in this area of science. And especially for the students here, I like to, I like to you know, to just tell you a little bit about my own uh, process of education and development. And so for me, it was back in, probably I was in, uh, you know, the sixth or seventh grade, and my dad, who was a, a professor at the University of Hawaii in, in literature, gave me a copy of Jim Watson's book called The Double Helix. And I read this book, and it was absolutely mind-blowing mind to me that scientists could come up with a way to understand and discover the structure of a molecule like DNA. And that, for me, was the beginning of thinking about, you know, wondering, gee, I wonder if I could work in that field someday. Could I actually do work that would uncover fundamental aspects of biology that nobody's ever figured out before? And I got really interested in that possibility. And, uh, and then, you know, as, as time went on, so I, you know, I was interested in chemistry, and I went off to uh, Southern California, a little farther south in here, uh, Pomona College, to get my undergraduate degree, and I was studying chemistry. And I took one biology class in college, and in that class we were taught about what was called the central dogma of molecular biology, namely that DNA, which is the code of life, encodes all of the information necessary to make a cell or an organism, and the, and the chemical uh, basis for this is that that information in DNA is conferred to the cell by transcription, which is a process that makes a transient copy of the DNA in the form of RNA molecules that are translated by the cell's machinery into proteins. And we were taught that it's really the proteins that are doing all of the functional work in the cell, and the DNA is really important because it's, it, it holds the, the fundamental information necessary to make all these proteins. And then this molecule in the middle called RNA is, you know, to us in college, it sounded really boring. It was this throwaway copy of the genome. And, uh, you know, and we were told it was just kind of the intermediary molecule. And I didn't think much more about it. 
But eventually, when I got to graduate school, I learned that sometimes RNA molecules function without encoding proteins, and that, in fact, there was a very exciting line of research going on at that time in the mid to late 1980s that showed that a lot of these molecules of RNA can actually do really interesting things in cells, and in fact, a number of scientists were starting to think that it was really RNA that gave rise to the life that we see on Earth, that these molecules of RNA could encode genetic information in their own right, as they do in a number of viruses today, and they could also carry out chemical functions. And so I pursued my graduate work studying that aspect of biology, and in an interesting way, that led me to the technology known as CRISPR. And the reason is that a number of years later, when I was now running my own uh, academic research laboratory, I got uh, exposed to a scientist who was studying how bacteria, or thinking about how bacteria fight viral infection. And our work studying this process and looking at how bacteria can acquire immunity to, uh, to viruses led to a technology now known as CRISPR-Cas, that is, um, is a, a technology that enables precise changes to be introduced into the DNA of cells. But that's not how we got started uh, working on it. It was really a, a question of the fundamental biology of these systems. And so you can imagine me sitting uh, in my office at Berkeley, uh, UC Berkeley, it was around 2005 or so, and one day I got a call from a colleague, uh, Jillian Banfield, who is uh, working in a very different area of science for me. She uh, studies the bacteria that grow in the environment. Most of these bugs have never been cultivated in the lab, and most scientists don't even know what they are. And what her research team does is go out and identify what these bugs are by sequencing their DNA. And in the process, they also sequence the DNA of the viruses that are interacting with these bugs to try to understand what their ecosystem is. How do these bugs grow and how do they fight off viruses that they encounter? And what can we learn fundamentally about life on our planet by understanding these kinds of organisms? And in the process of that research, her lab was one of the very first to notice that a lot of bacteria had in their DNA a very unusual sequence. And, it was a, and so what this cartoon shows you here is a picture, a cartoon of the bacterial chromosome. This is the DNA of a bacterium. And what Banfield's lab identified was that in many of these bacteria, there's a place in the genome that has a series of short DNA repeats shown by the plaque diamonds that flank pieces of DNA that have a unique sequence shown by the colored boxes. And these were really distinctive because most parts of the bacterial DNA didn't have these repetitive elements. So, you know, she and a few others were noticing this pattern of repeats. And uh, they had come to be called CRISPRs, which stands for Clusters of Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. I won't say that again. And, um, but now this, this acronym CRISPR, you see it in the media sometimes, and uh, you, know, you might think that it stands for a new kind of cracker or the place where you store your vegetables, but now you know that it's actually this pattern of DNA sequences. And furthermore, these sequences have what are known as Cas or CRISPR-associated genes that are hanging out nearby in the genome. And these genes encode proteins, and when they were first discovered, nobody knew what they did but they were distinctive because they always occurred and they sat in the genome next to these CRISPR arrays. And the question was, what are these doing? And the reason that uh, Banfield, Jill Banfield called me up was because of two things. One is that right around that time, three different publications had appeared in the scientific literature reporting that in these CRISPR arrays, the unique sequences came from viruses. And so this was a very interesting observation. And again, nobody knew why, but it was, and, uh, gave uh, some scientists the idea that this might be some way of storing information about viral infection that happens in bacteria. Why? Nobody knew at the time, but it seemed interesting. 
And furthermore, Jill, uh, being a very astute uh, scientist, even though she doesn't do experimental work in the lab, she wondered if these stored viral sequences were being used in cells in the form of RNA molecules. And knowing that I work on RNA, she thought that it might be something that our lab could investigate. And so um, over the next couple of years, there were really just a handful of labs worldwide that had started to pay attention to these, these CRISPR sequences. And what emerged in the scientific literature was uh, genetic evidence that the way these, these systems operate is, is the following. So in cells that have a CRISPR array here and the associated genes, uh, these cells are able to detect viral DNA that gets injected into the cell during a viral infection. And once that injection occurs, the cell can acquire a little piece of the viral DNA and store it in the CRISPR array. So this is a, an adaptive system, so new sequences are being stored all the time. And then the cell uses the, the, those sequences by making an RNA copy. So this is a molecule that is chemically related to DNA, but it's able to uh, exist in the cell as a single strand rather than a double helix like in DNA. And these molecules of RNA produced initially as a long string of, uh, of sequence are cut up into shorter units that each include a sequence acquired from a virus. And importantly, those RNAs then combine with proteins encoded by the Cas genes to form a protein RNA complex that can surveil the cell looking for a sequence that matches the sequence in the RNA. And when that match occurs, then the proteins are recruited to that particular uh, molecule of DNA and the DNA is destroyed. And so for bacteria, it's a terrific way to acquire immunity to viruses and store it at the level of DNA and then uh, sort of deploy it in this uh, way that I just illustrated. Um, and so for me, as a, you know, a biochemist and somebody that's always sort of asked the why questions in my lab, or you know, uh, you know, how, how and why does, does a system operate at the molecular level, we were interested at this stage in getting involved to understand how these molecules actually function. And so one of the things that's really interesting about um, these, these CRISPR systems is that they're quite diverse. And this is a cartoon that just shows that, uh, there's, there, that uh, if we look at the different types and numbers of genes, and that's what these little boxes illustrate that are part of the, these CRISPR-Cas immune systems, you can see that there's lots of variability. Some of these systems had a lot of different genes that were in part of it. And, uh, but, and then a number of others down here had really just one or two genes, some of them very large uh, genes that were required for this adaptive immune system to function. And although we started off initially studying the, the types of CRISPR systems shown at the top that had lots of genes involved, I went to a conference in, in 2011 and I met a, a scientist, Emmanuel Charpentier, who was studying a CRISPR system down here that had a single large gene called Cas9 required for CRISPR-based immunity. And when she and I met at that conference, we realized that we have uh, complementary expertise. I'm a biochemist, she's a microbiologist, and we decided to get together to answer this question, namely, what is the function of the protein that's encoded by this gene called Cas9? And it seemed like a really interesting protein. Nobody knew the function of it at the time, but it was known genetically to be essential for bugs that have this type of CRISPR pathway to fight off viruses. And so the question was, how does it work? And that's what we set out to understand. And that led to a fantastic uh, global, uh, sort of international uh, partnership. She, her lab was in Sweden at the time. My group was in Berkeley. And, um, you know, thank goodness for Skype and, and, and programs like that because we were able to par uh, collaborate with our colleagues in Europe by, uh, uh, by communicating mostly over the, over the internet and sharing data and ideas even though our students had never met each other initially, right? And, uh, and what, what, uh, we had two fantastic scientists, Martin Yinek in my lab, Chris Chylinski in Emmanuel's lab, who were able to work together to figure out 
what, the, what this Cas9 protein does. And it turned out to be an amazing little molecular machine because it operates by recognizing a DNA molecule, and I'm showing you the DNA here in, just in a very schematic way, to show you that this is a protein, uh, the, car, the blue uh, cartoon is the Cas9 protein, that interacts with DNA by recognizing a 20-letter sequence in the DNA that matches the sequence in this molecule of RNA here that comes from the CRISPR array. And remember that this is a, the, the part of the CRISPR RNA molecule is derived from a virus. So the 20 letters on this end of the molecule recognize a DNA molecule that has a matching sequence. So in a, vi in a bacterium, this would be a DNA molecule that comes from a virus. And when that match occurs, the DNA helix unwinds and the protein is able to use two separate chemical centers to cut the DNA, much like you might cut a ribbon or a rope, just cuts apart the DNA and breaks it up uh, at precisely the position uh, that exists within this matching uh, sequence that matches the RNA molecule. Now, Martin and Christoph, in doing their experiments, uh, re also recognize something else that turned out to be essential for this enzyme, this Cas9 protein, to function like this. And that was that in addition to the CRISPR RNA, which provides the zip code, if you will, for DNA recognition, this system requires a second molecule of RNA called tracer, which is the molecule shown right here, that provides a handle for the Cas9 protein to bind. Uh, to bind to. And so the, these two separate RNA molecules are essential for Cas9 to work. And once we understood that, Martin Yinek, who was a very uh, sort of uh, uh, biochemically minded person in the lab, who was always thinking about, you know, how do these molecules actually work and can I, can I, can I rejigger them compared to what nature has done, he realized that we could actually link together these two separate RNAs into a single guide RNA that would include the targeting information on one end and the handle for binding to Cas9 on the other. And once we did that, uh, made that change and did experiments showing that these single guide RNAs were effective at targeting Cas9 to DNA sequences, we also realized that it was now trivial to change the sequence of letters on the end of the RNA at this position to allow Cas9 to interact with any desired DNA molecule and make a, a precise uh, double-stranded break. So imagine having a, basically a pair of scissors, it's like having a scalpel or something for the genome, where you can go in, you can program this thing to find a particular place in all of the DNA in a cell, find one place and uh, make a precise cut. So that, that was kind of, kind of cool and, you know, it was kind of really interesting that bacteria had evolved this fascinating little machine to cut viral DNA. But there was actually a bigger implication of this that occurred to us as we were doing these experiments. And here's the implication. So in parallel with this little very niche area of CRISPR biology that was going on at the time, there was a large body of work that had been uh, focused on studying how our cells, human cells and plant cells, basically any kind of animal or plant system, handles uh, damaged DNA. And what that line of research had revealed was that in our cells, unlike in bacteria where when DNA is broken, it's rapidly degraded, in our cells, when DNA gets broken, it's actually repaired and it's repaired quite efficiently. And so this is a cartoon that shows that when uh, a double-stranded break happens in uh, the DNA of an animal or plant cell, the cell can quickly identify the broken ends of the DNA and repair them in pathways that involve either introducing a small change to the DNA during the repair process or by integrating a whole new piece of DNA uh, at the site of the repair, at the site of the break. And so in this way, genomes could actually be edited by introducing a double-stranded break at a position where one might want to introduce a change to this code. And so the challenge for scientists and people that had been working on this for quite a while was, how do you introduce a double-stranded break 
at a place where you might want to change the DNA sequence. And there, had, there were various technologies that had come along for doing this that were powerful, but they were difficult to deploy. And so most labs, even my own, had looked at these technologies and said, wow, that's really cool, but we don't have the money or the expertise to actually use those technologies because, you know, we're not, we're not genome engineers. And the wonderful thing about this CRISPR system in bacteria is that, lo and behold, nature had already come up with a great way to break DNA in a precise fashion, in a controllable, programmable way. We just had to find it, right? And that's the great serendipity of this whole um, field, is that the discovery of this system was a curiosity-driven project that led to a powerful technology. So I'm going to show you a video. This is a, um, this is a kind of an artist's rendition of how we imagine these CRISPR molecules work when they get in to an animal or a plant cell. So here we're zooming into a, a, a cell that has the DNA encapsulated in the nucleus, and the DNA is highly compacted. So this bacterial protein, Cas9, with its guiding RNA, has to search through all of the DNA in the nucleus to find a single place that has a 20-letter match to the RNA molecule that is the programming uh, guide for Cas9. And when that match occurs, it opens up the DNA, makes the cut, and then here's where the magic happens. This is where the editing actually happens. The cell uh, has a way of detecting that break and sending in repair enzymes to fix it, in this example, by integrating a new piece of genetic information during the repair process. And so this has become a tool that is incredibly powerful for allowing scientists to introduce a double-stranded break or more than one to make changes to genomes in essentially any kind of cell or organism that allows control over the editing process. And I wanted to share with you just, you know, again, I'm a, you know, so I, I've always sort of asked the, the how questions in my own lab, and I wanted to share with you a little bit of research that we've been doing to understand how this actually works. It's kind of an amazing thing. And when you see a video like that, it might almost look like science fiction. Can that really happen? And yet it does. And so we'd love to understand that process. And so we've been busily working away in our lab at Berkeley to try to figure out this mechanism of recognition. How does that 20-letter sequence in the RNA actually trigger opening up of the DNA duplex and the ability of Cas9 to make this precise cut? And, uh, and so this is, a, this is actually a 3D printed model of the Cas9 protein. So it's been possible now to crystallize this complex and have a look at the molecular structure. And um, we, we can make a, a 3D printed model that's based on that, that molecular structure. And this model is actually about yay big, and you know, it sits on my desk at home at Berkeley, and when I'm there, you know, I virtually use it almost every day, because I'm, you know, I'm sitting with my students, and we're looking at this thing, and trying to figure out how it works, and thinking about the way that it is able to unwind uh, DNA. And I want to point out just a couple of things here. So the protein is the white molecule. It's got the orange uh, guide RNA sitting in the center, and when it grabs onto DNA, it literally opens up the DNA helix and, and inserts this piece of RNA. So it forms an RNA-DNA helix inside the protein. That's the mechanism of recognition. And then, uh, because it's got the two strands of DNA separated, that allows the cleavers to come in and make a precise cut. And so we've been, you know, uh, really uh, wondering how this works. And one of the things that's interesting about Cas9 is that it's able to open up the DNA, but it does that without any external energy source, right? So just like a masseuse, it has to tease apart these strands, but it doesn't have to, it doesn't have any way of providing, it doesn't, um, you know, if you're a biochemist, you know about ATP and GTP and um, using the uh, energy of breaking the bonds and those molecules to do something else, to do work. Well, this Cas9 protein doesn't do that. It has to get the energy for this DNA melting from somewhere else. And one of the clues to how it works is actually comes from comparing its structural states 
as it assembles with RNA and DNA. And from doing that, we know that this is a protein that undergoes a very profound structural rearrangement. So this is showing you the protein changing shape as it grabs onto its RNA um, uh, molecule there in orange that it provides the targeting information and forms the, the complex that is able to surveil the cell to look for a matching piece of DNA. When it binds DNA, there's an additional structural rearrangement that accommodates that RNA-DNA hybrid in the center. And then finally, this is the chemical cleaver. It swings into position and then actually makes the cut. And there's a, not showing it to you here, but there's a sensor in the molecule that detects base pairing between the RNA and the DNA, and that's part of its mechanism of accuracy. So it makes sure that it's really associated with the right segment of DNA before the cleaver swings into position and makes the cut. So it's a beautiful example of how this has evolved over many eons in bacteria to be a highly effective way of recognizing just those pieces of DNA that the bacterium wants to cut up, namely uh, viruses. And, uh, and then I just wanted to show you also um, this picture. So this is a, this is a, I'll sh and this is also an animation um, that shows you the, the uh, molecular structure of Cas9 bound to a double-stranded piece of DNA. So the DNA is in blue and magenta in this, uh, in this molecule, in this structure. And you can see the RNA-DNA hybrid here and the DNA opening up inside the protein. It's a, um, a, a system that has the ability to recognize essentially any uh, DNA sequence. So the sequence of the RNA can be ch easily changed on this end to allow interaction with different uh, segments of DNA. And then here's this cleaver swinging into position so that it can actually make the cut once this uh, protein has assembled with the right piece of DNA. And so I wanted to just um, talk now a little bit about two particular aspects of this field and where they're going, because I think they illustrate both where we're sort of what's happening on the technology development side of things, and then how we're actually going to be able to use CRISPR-Cas genome editing in ways that I think are going to end up affecting all of our, our lives going forward. And I'll start with the technology development, and that, that's really um, sort of this top question, which is, are there new kinds of CRISPR systems? And you know, the short answer is yes. And, and what's really interesting, as I mentioned before, is that these CRISPR systems in bacteria are found very widely across the microbial kingdom, and they're really diverse. And so as people like Jill Banfield have continued to investigate all of the bugs that are in our environment and look at the kinds of CRISPR enzymes and pathways that they have, she's been able to uncover a number of new examples of proteins that are part of these pathways. And these are just three of the uh, recent ones that we've identified, two proteins called CasX and CasY, and then some new examples of the Cas9 uh, enzyme. And what's interesting about these proteins, and CasX in particular, is that it's, a, it's encoded by a gene that's quite a bit smaller than the gene that encodes Cas9. And that means that the resulting protein is quite a bit smaller. And um, this is just showing a picture of the, the uh, actual genomic locus that includes this CasX protein. So here's the CRISPR array over here. That tracer molecule is part of it as well. We have three genes that are important for the front end of this pathway, namely for recognizing viral DNA and inter inserting those little sequences into the CRISPR array. So that's the adaptive part of the immune system. And then uh, there was this other protein, and we didn't know what it was, but we sort of hypothesized that this might be the, the Cas9 equivalent, maybe the enzyme that is on the other end of the pathway responsible for actually targeting uh, viral uh, or any kind of DNA uh, molecule. And so in, in some very recent work, and this isn't even published yet, so I'm showing you some, some uh, very, very new hot off the lab bench uh, kind of results. This is a picture of what this CasX protein looks like with its guide RNA. And one of the things that was very interesting to us is that this protein sits right here. It's sitting kind of at the top of this RNA lollipop 
And the RNA is a much larger component of this combined protein RNA complex than what we saw for Cas9. Don't know why that is, but we do know that it's essential uh, that the RNA be that big. It's required to, to, uh, for this protein to be functional. And furthermore, it turns out that this protein works just like Cas9 does. For, it's very effective as an RNA-guided DNA targeter. And I just wanted to show you one piece of evidence for this. So this is an experiment that we can do in bacterial cells. So we have bacteria that are growing on a plate, and these bacteria are expressing two different kinds of fluorescent proteins. They're for expressing a green fluorescent protein and a red fluorescent protein. And when those proteins are made together, the cells look kind of yellow, like this. <clears throat> and then what we do is we use the CasX protein uh, with a guide RNA that is interacting with the gene encoding the green fluorescent protein with the idea of turning that gene off. And what you can see is that when we do that, now all the cells look red. And that's because the cells are still alive and they're making the red fluorescent protein, but they're no longer able to make the green fluorescent protein because we've used CasX to turn it off. And it's really efficient because basically every single cell that you see growing here is now no longer able to make the green fluorescent protein. So that's one of the types of experiments that can be done to test the actual uh, ability of these kinds of enzymes to interact with DNA and have a specific kind of effect. So um, how do we take proteins like this, like whether it's Cas9 or CasX or any of these other enzymes that are you know, coming out of the fundamental discoveries of these pathways, and how do we turn them into effective um, uh, uh, applications, whether it's in biomedicine or agriculture? We need to be able to harness their capabilities for genome editing. And I wanted to speak a little bit about how that's done and what the current challenges are, and then tell you about some really exciting examples of what's happening right now with this kind of technology. So when I think about especially the, the challenges to using uh, genome editing therapeutically, I think you know, there's sort of really three big ones in my mind, um, and there's a lot of smaller ones too, but these are, these are kind of the big ones. So the big ones are, are delivery, so how we introduce genome editing molecules into tissues or, or uh, systems where the editing is necessary. How do we control the way that DNA repair happens? Because you now know that what CRISPR is, is that it's the scissors, but it's not the actual repair enzyme, right? That's the job of the cell. And so what scientists are trying to do right now is not only understand how that repair happens, but also control it so we can ensure that we get the desired editing outcome when we use a system like CRISPR-Cas9. And then thirdly, and very importantly, is um, is the, uh, the whole aspect of ethical and societal considerations, especially for certain applications of CRISPR-Cas9, and we'll get there in a, in a few minutes. So right now, um, there's, this is a slide that just illustrates some of the many, many different kinds of cells and organisms that have been edited using uh, CRISPR-Cas9. And if you look at this for a couple of minutes, you'll see that you know, it's got insects, we've got plants, we've got fungi, uh, we've got all kinds of human cells, we've got various kinds of animals. So what's been amazing over the last six years since Emmanuel Charpentier and I first published our, our research is that scientists around the world very quickly started adopting this system for their favorite experiment and their favorite organism. And so far, we found that this is an active system in, in effectively every uh, kind of cell and organism where it's been tested. So it's very, it makes it very powerful, and it's kind of a democratizing tool. It makes it easy for scientists everywhere to apply this in, uh, for their research, certainly, and, uh, and also for, we think, in the future for um, various kinds of applications. So what are those applications? And I, I really I put them into five buckets here. Uh, research, of course, but also healthcare, therapeutics, agriculture, and diagnostics. And these are all areas that right now are being profoundly impacted by CRISPR-Cas genome editing because of the ability of scientists now to control the DNA in cells and thereby really control the code of life and control the way that cells are accessing the information that they need to grow and develop. 
So let's take a look at a few of the things that are, that are happening that are, that are really um, interesting. And I think, you know, on the research side of things, you know, one of the things that happened pretty quickly in this field is that um, scientists realized that instead of having to restrict their studies of genetics in, in organisms to just those few that had been carefully um, you know, cul cultivated in labs over many years, like fruit flies and certain kinds of little worms and, um, and certain kinds of yeast. Now, the ability to study genetics opened up to any kind of organism. And this was actually a slide that I got from uh, a, a graduate student working at a laboratory at New York University in Claude Desplan's lab, where he said that suddenly his work on butterflies had totally changed because instead of having to collect animals in the wild and just look and observe the wing patterns and try to discern things about their uh, genetics by observation, they were actually able to use CRISPR-Cas9 to make changes to the DNA of these butterflies and figure out what the genetics were for wing pattern uh, formation and, and, um, and color patterns. And this, this you know, capability is now possible in many kinds of organisms where people can suddenly do genetics in a way that wasn't possible just a few years ago. So, um, so one of the things that that does then is to make possible, again, the kinds of experiments that until recently would have been absolutely in the realm of science fiction. And here's, here's an example of that. So um, a guy named Svante Pabo has uh, been, become quite well known for his work sequencing the genome of Neanderthals, a huge accomplishment, and is starting to tell us a lot about the molecular evolution of Homo sapiens and sort of who we are at the level of our genes. And so one of the questions that's emerging from that line of experiment is the fact that there seem to be differences in genes that, are, that correspond to brain development in Neanderthals versus modern humans. And yet, until recently, it wasn't possible to ask questions experimentally about that. And so what Svante Pavo's lab is now doing is they're using pieces of tissue called organoids that can be grown from human cells that develop into these sort of brain-like or at least have some properties of, of the brain. And they can engineer those cells to have genes that come from the Neanderthal genome that are thought to affect brain development. And they can use that as a way to study the effect of these Neanderthal genes on neuronal development in an otherwise uh, context of a human genome. So fascinating, don't know the outcome of that yet, but that's uh, the kind of thing that's now possible uh, using CRISPR-Cas gene editing. Um, and then I want, uh, on, the, on the topic of healthcare, I wanted to point out that in addition to ways that we may have in the future to correct uh, genetic diseases in humans, I think other ways that may impact human health come from uh, the ability to manipulate the genomes of animals. And this is an example using CRISPR-Cas to modify the pig genome to do two things. One is to remove endogenous viruses that are part of these pig genomes, and the other is to create animals that have more human-like organs that could be uh, better suited to organ donation, something that um, both companies and academic labs are, are actively pursuing. In our own lab, so one of the things that I would have never imagined doing in my previous life was uh, being able to you know, think about an actual strategy for dealing with neurodegenerative disease. And so we've been working on an idea where uh, we take CRISPR-Cas9, so that's this little cartoon here, and modify the surface of the protein to give it uh, the ability to penetrate uh, neuronal cells. And then what we do is to take these programmed Cas9 enzymes and inject them across the blood-brain barrier. And this is, we're doing this in a, uh, right now in a mouse uh, model of a neurodegenerative disease so that we can observe DNA editing in just particular areas of the brain. And this is an example where we use a mouse that's been engineered so that when the cells are edited, they turn red, makes it very easy to see uh, uh, the extent of editing that occurs. 
And you can see here that when we do injections on both sides of the brain, we get a reasonable volume of tissue that gets edited on, on both sides using CRISPR-Cas9. And, and our, our current work focuses on using this kind of a delivery strategy in an animal model of Huntington's disease, which is a well-known genetic uh, neurodegenerative disease, with the idea that eventually if we can get um, therapeutically meaningful levels of editing in this animal model, we'd like to move towards uh, clinical trials in humans partnering with clinicians that work with these patients. And, um, and I, I don't want to neglect to point out that I think in addition to all of these applications that are important in, in, in thinking about human healthcare, I think that uh, the impact in agriculture will be equally large or potentially much larger because of the ability now to modify plant genomes in a precise fashion. And just one quick example of this is work going on by Zach Lippman, who is a scientist at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, who has been doing beautiful work modifying tomatoes using CRISPR-Cas9 to have different numbers of, um, of flowers and hence different numbers of fruits. And he had this incredible presentation that I saw in New York a few weeks ago where he's now been able to do this, uh, where he had a slide showing a whole, you know, something like 15 different uh, variants of tomatoes that had exactly the same genes except for one that was responsible for the, the, the number of flowers on the plant so that the plants went from producing no tomatoes to, you know, dozens of tomatoes. And it was really, really powerful uh, demonstration of how gene editing can be used now to control uh, crop yields and, and we think in the near future many other traits in plants that will be very valuable in different environments around the world. And lest I uh, leave off, I didn't want to leave off this last uh, point, which is the development very recently of CRISPR-Cas enzymes that are likely to be useful for diagnostics. And this came about, again, from fundamental research going on in my lab and a few others that were studying activities of these CRISPR-Cas proteins that showed that some of them can be harnessed as a detection system for DNA, that instead of um, cutting up, uh, making uh, double-stranded breaks to DNA, is actually able to recognize a target sequence. And by uh, engineering the system, you can use a fluorescently labeled substrate molecule, in this case, a single-stranded DNA, that is cleaved very rapidly when this protein finds its target. And that releases a fluorescent signal that says, I found my target, and it makes it very easy to detect DNA or even RNA molecules in uh, samples. And we think this is going to be useful for all sorts of applications, not only for detecting viruses and bacteria, but potentially even for screening for uh, DNA molecules associated with cancer. So um, I just want to close by, by circling back to this question of ethics. And, you know, you can maybe appreciate that, you know, I'm a, I'm a biochemist and, you know, I, I, I sort of... I've always been in interested in the fundamental questions in biology. I never really imagined that my work would have much of a, you know, I mean, I hoped it would have some kind of a little impact in the world, but, you know, I never imagined that it would be something that people would someday be, you know, really talking about in the media and people would be speculating about, you know, governmental use of something like this. And so when this technology began to really take off in, in 2013 and 2014, I realized that, you know, we needed to really think hard about how it's going to be deployed in the future. And in particular, there's this question of using it in what's called the germline. So we can imagine gene editing in, in sort of two kinds of cells. If we do gene editing in cells that are fully developed and differentiated, then they affect that one organism or person, but they don't affect their progeny. They don't affect their children. But what if we did gene editing in what are called germ cells? So that would be eggs or sperm or embryos. Well, then those DNA changes become part of the entire organism, and they can be passed on to future generations. And so we now have a technology that allows us, in principle, to control our own evolution or the evolution of anything else, right? It's a very, very powerful thing. And um, so I started thinking about this, and you know, I started realizing that 
uh, you know, people were already sort of doing germline editing in various kinds of animals and in plants. Uh, why not humans? It seemed like there was no technical reason why one couldn't do this. And this is actually showing you a pipette tip that's holding on to a fertilized mouse egg with a needle that's injecting CRISPR-Cas9 right here. And when you do this in a mouse embryo, you can, you know, pretty easily make changes in the germline that become part of that entire animal. And, um, and in fact, we now know that, you know, from research that published just in the last year, we know that uh, this is now possible to do in viable human embryos as well. And uh, it looks like it, it works. And, um, and so people are, you know, asking and have been asking for a few years now, um, should we do this? And, you know, how do, we, how do we regulate it? How do we think about the ethics and the safety and efficacy of this? Under what circumstances would we want to do this? And, uh, of course, there's been lots of media speculation, right? This was a cover of The Economist a, a few years ago under the banner Editing Humanity and people thinking about what about enhancements. Um, and the short answer to that is that, you know, for the most part, we don't know enough about the genome to be able to make genetic changes that would lead to these kinds of enhancements, but it's coming, you know? It's, I think many of us in, in, in science, you know, we, we can see that this is a, this is a direction that, uh, that is uh, being pursued in, in many parts of the world, in labs uh, that are, you know, uh, 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 around the world. And so, um, I've been very actively involved in, in uh, sort of encouraging scientists in particular to be involved in this discussion. And, and recently there was a report, this was issued last year from the National Academies on human genome editing, and in particular human germline editing, making recommendations at the time that suggested that scientists should refrain from using human germline editing clinically. In other words, to create a, an actual baby or person that would have those kinds of edits. Um, but, you know, the field is moving ahead quickly, and um, we're actually having a meeting in two weeks in Hong Kong to revisit this issue with a particular focus on what's happening in Asia, because there's lots of developments there. And I think that, you know, that, that this, this is just a, you know, it's a, it's a very active area of discussion right now about how uh, we can to collectively understand and regulate this kind of, of use of genome editing. So we'll open that up maybe to the questions uh, afterwards, but I just want to conclude by pointing out that uh, what I call RNA-guided genome editing is powerful technology for manipulating genomes, and there's, I didn't go into it all tonight, but there's many sort of ways of, of, of using it to control the flow of information from DNA that are uh, really impacting everything, sort of essentially all fields of biology where that kind of DNA manipulation is useful. Applications of editing are, are going to depend on both delivery into cells and also control, and I mean control both in a chemical sense but also in a societal sense. And finally, we know that continuing investigations of fundamental biology, and in particular biology of bacteria, for example, studying new CRISPR systems, will continue to drive uh, new technology development as these um, ideas lead to understandings that, uh, of fundamental functions of these proteins that can be harnessed for various purposes. I would uh, be remiss in not showing you a picture of my lab. So these are my uh, lab members at Berkeley. And this includes, a, you, if you look here, a very diverse group of people. These are uh, students ranging from undergraduate students at Berkeley uh, to all the way to people that have had several years of postdoctoral training that are all working together on these problems. So it's an incredible honor to work with them. And, um, you know, for me, science has always been very collaborative. So Emmanuel Charpentier uh, was the person who we started off working on Cas9 with, so uh, huge uh, kudos to her and her laboratory. We have a number of colleagues at Berkeley that we've worked on uh, various aspects of this research with. And we've also started to increasingly work with clinical teams. And I'm just mentioning one of them here, Joel Pilevsky. So he's a, a clinician who works on human papillomavirus and the kinds of cancers that it causes. And we've been working with his team to develop CRISPR as a diagnostic for sample, patient samples to be able to tell people very quickly if they have this type of infection and if they do, how they can quickly take steps to mitigate and prevent cancer. 
And finally, as you probably know, uh, scientists like me have to get funding for our work, and uh, we get it by writing grants and uh, trying to convince our peers to give us money. So I want to thank all of these groups, and in particular to point out that in my case, the research on CRISPR would have never happened if it wasn't for these two organizations, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and the National Science Foundation. So these two groups uh, were both funding my research and gave us a money that allowed us to pursue this crazy bacterial immune system called CRISPR back before anybody knew uh, where it was headed. So I'll be for, forever grateful to them. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to the discussion to follow. You want my mic? <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, can you just let me know that Dr. Stuart Feinstein is going to be here? Okay. So we're just going to bring out two chairs here. Um, Dr. Stuart Feinstein from UCSB's <clears throat> Molecular, Cellular, and Developmental Biology Department will be asking the questions. We've collected some of those from audiences via, from the audience via email uh, from ticket uh, buyers. And then after that, I want to remind everyone that uh, Dr. Doudna will be signing copies of her book up here on the stage. Uh, Chaucer's is in the lobby with copies of the book. Uh, and it's a very interesting and beautiful book, so um, she very kindly agreed to do that. So I think we're ready to start. So Dr. Feinstein, if you want to join us up on stage, and uh, we'll start from right here. I didn't know I was doing this. Okay, thank you, Jennifer, for a wonderful talk. Um, we have questions here. This is very different. I lecture in this hall all the time, but this is very different to be sitting up here with somebody. <laughs> um, so we have some questions, and since this is sort of a broad audience of students and some faculty and lots of community members, um, I will try to make the questions a little something for everybody. So let's start with the students, since that's why we're all here. Um, one of the questions from a student was, what people or events were most influential in your career development? I think uh, I've, I've certainly had several teachers who were incredibly um, important to me, all the way from, as I talked about with the students today, from my third grade teacher, who I recently saw in Hawaii, it was great, uh, all the way up to my you know, graduate and postdoc uh, mentors. And I think the, the common theme for, for those folks is that they were all people who kind of saw my insecurities, I guess, at different stages of my development and were able to work with me to um, build up my self-confidence and help me to achieve, you know, what I, what I was really excited about doing. So I'm forever grateful to them. And I also want to give a special shout out to two other people. One is my dad. So my father was uh, not a scientist, but you know, was somebody who was very interested in science. And I think that he saw in me very early on this little spark of you know, maybe scientific uh, inclination, and he encouraged it. And you know that's that's really great. Sadly, he didn't he didn't live to you know see me do all of this, but you know but he's there in spirit all the time with me. And the other the other person I really want to give a shout out to is my my spouse, so Jamie Kate, professor at Berkeley, who is someone who again is you know always been interested in the in the how questions in science, and we do a lot of debating at our house about you know what 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 happened in your lab today and what does it mean and and uh, you know that's that kind of discussion has always been incredibly motivating to me. And believe me, there's been plenty of times when I'm tearing my hair out over some experiment or something, and he's sort of always, always there, and he knows, uh, you know, he understands this sort of crazy passion that we have, so. Okay, this is another student-y type question. Um, what advice do you have for students just beginning their careers in biology? Well, I think my advice uh, starts with Pursuing your passion, and, and I think what goes hand in hand with that is figuring out what really gets you excited. You know, what really gets you out of bed in the morning? Because I think, you know, what I see in my students, and I, I saw this in myself too when I was, you know, in my earlier stages, was, you know, trying to figure out what 
kind of science do I want to do and what kind of answer do I feel satisfied with? And I realized for myself that I'm more on the chemistry side of things. I really like thinking about things at the level of molecules and you know, the atoms, how are they organized and how they work and how do they do chemistry. That's always gotten me excited. But I, you know, when I have students that come to my lab, I realize that you know, people, are, you know, people have different, different kinds of, of problems that they get excited about and different kinds of answers they want to pursue. And I think once you figure that out, if you get in that groove, you can do anything, you know, and that's what I see over and over with people in my lab. You get them on to help them find the right project that really jives with what they're excited about doing, and they just go farther than you could ever predict. This one may embarrass you a little bit, but it's right from a student. <laughs> While studying to become a scientist, did you believe you were destined to accomplish something great? <laughs> no. <laughs> No, absolutely. Not. That's a, it's a great question because, you know, I think, um, I, I often think back these days to, you know, when I was growing up in Hawaii and I was actually recently back, you know, visiting my, my hometown doing kind of an event like this. And, and uh, I, couldn't have, I couldn't have imagined it. I, I remember this one time when I, you know, I was in high school and, you know, I was, uh, I, was at, 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 I was at a party and we were sitting in somebody's backyard at night, you know, and having a couple of beers and, and uh, you know, we were talking about what do you want to do when, when you grow up, you know? And I was talking to a good friend of mine, and you know, I, I said, I said, what do you want to do when you grow up? And he said, well, I, I want to be a, I want to, I want to have a brew pub, you know? And I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. And he said, what do you want to do? And I said, I, I want to be a biochemist. And he's like, oh, that sounds really weird and nerdy. And um, but here we are, you know. Uh, I won't say how many years later, but. A, a, a number of years later, and uh, we're both doing that. So he became a great, a very famous brewer. He's won tons of international prizes and been highly successful. And, you know, I'm a biochemist. And, and so, um, you know, we, we got together recently and we're like, wow, do you remember that time we were like 15 and said... <laughs> so yeah, my point is, you just, you know, you just have to, I think you have to pursue what you're passionate at doing. And, and again, it's a great example of, you know, each of us we're passionate about something, and we just didn't let anybody dissuade us from doing it. Okay, let's move a little bit more over to the science, and this is redundant to a question I asked you this afternoon, so I apologize, but it's a different group. Um, and you alluded to this in your talk a couple of times, but I thought it might be a good thing for everybody to hear your thoughts about the importance of basic science in the development of genetic engineering, if you go back even restriction enzymes in a way, that was a study of a similar question to what you were asking, how do virus, how do bacteria evade a viral infection or plasmids? So basic science in general, and then also specifically with respect to CRISPR. Well, you know, if, if you think about the, and you just, you just uh, brought up a great example of restriction enzymes, but, you know, if you think about some of the key technologies that have come along in the sort of, you know, what we call the era of molecular biology, really since the 1970s or so, um, a lot of those, those technologies have actually come from bacteria, right? Restriction enzymes is one example, but uh, the polymerase chain reaction, which is a way of amplifying DNA, that's also come from enzymes that are found in bacteria, and uh, a, a way of um, lighting up proteins called the green, using the green fluorescent protein came from studying organisms that have the ability to, you know, use a fluorescent protein in response to signals in the environment. So, you know, these are great examples where scientists were working on very fundamental questions in biology that might have seemed kind of, kind of wonky at the time, but they led to technologies that had a profound impact. And I think that you know, this really just underscores the importance of curiosity-driven science and the value of funding scientists who are interested in all sorts of things that don't necessarily have any clear application to a, a disease, but um, lead to discoveries that none of us could predict that in fact have very, very profound uh, impacts on, on human health, sort of broadly defined. So several people wrote questions that in one form or other asked about the potential for using non-genome, non-gene, non-germline uh, editing, for example, in blood disorders. So I used the expression earlier today, if you had a crystal ball, if you had a crystal ball, what sort of duration do you think it'll be before that'll be in clinical testing? 
I'm aware of a couple of groups that are um, in discussions right now with the Food and Drug Administration to begin clinical trials for sickle cell anemia, which is a well-known blood disorder, well-known genetic basis. And so I think, you know, I, I anticipate those trials beginning in the next, you know, somewhere between 12 to 18 months. And um, so I, you know, and it's hard to always predict, of course, how these will turn out. But I think, you know, the opportunities for treating blood disorders in general, like other diseases known as thalassemias that also have clear uh, genetic uh, causes that are, are well-defined, I think are other, other good targets for initial uses of gene editing. And part of the reason is that it's easier to do that kind of editing because it can be done in blood stem cells that are taken from a patient, edited, and then put back into the body. So it kind of removes this whole issue of, of delivery. But I think down the line, we're going to see, uh, you know, there's lots of interest in using gene editing in the eye for genetic uh, causes of blindness. And again, it's a, the eye is a, a tissue that, at least in principle, is maybe easier to deliver to than having to deliver something systemically. Um, and also liver disorders for the same reason. It's a tissue that tends to be easier to deliver to. And then farther be out from that, but places, you know, as you saw briefly in my talk, you know, we really would love to see this utilized eventually for treating neurodegenerative disease. So this is again a repeat from this afternoon, but how do you grapple with the duality of knowing all the great potential and applications of CRISPR while at the same time you clearly appreciate that it's a technology that could be abused? Look, I mean, I think CRISPR is not unique uh, as a technology in the sense that, you know, like, like many things, uh, it can be used to do uh, very, very things that I think we would all agree are, are, are very wonderful and, and powerful in a positive way, but it also has the potential to be used um, to, to cause uh, great problems and, um, and, and things with, with real ethical challenges. So I deal with that by focusing on what I can do to both advance the science in ways that I think will be um, important and, and positive, but also to be very actively engaging in a discussion about the use of the technology, not only with uh, scientists, but with uh, audiences like this, and, and um, also with people in our government and in our regulatory agencies who need to understand the science and the technology so that they can do their jobs of uh, thinking about how we regulate the uses of the technology. Um, about a half an hour ago, I was rereading the prologue. Well, about an hour and a half ago, actually. Half an hour ago, I was listening to you. Um, but I was struck by uh, something you wrote here, and this was in reference to the Napa meeting in 2015. So Dr. Doudna organized a meeting of many different stakeholders to begin to discuss the ethical issues of this back in 2015. And you were speaking about germline gene editing, and you said, my own views on the subject are still evolving, but I was struck by a comment made during the January 19, 2015 meeting I organized to discuss human germline editing in embryos. 17 people, including the co-author of this book, my former PhD student, Sam Sternberg, were sitting around a conference table in California's Napa Valley having a heated debate about if and when germline editing could be allowed. Suddenly, someone leaned into the group and said very quietly, Someday we may consider it unethical not to use germline editing to alleviate human suffering. The remark turned our conversation on its head, and it still comes to mind whenever I meet with parents or would-be parents who are facing the devastating effects of genetic disorders. So my question is, how did that conversation end, and has sentiment on it evolved since that time? Um, well, so, so that description is, is, is really apt because that's exactly what happened. And when that person made their comment, it, it kind of shut the whole thing down. You know, everybody just stopped and realized, whoa, you know, that's a different way to think about this. And, um, and I think that the thinking in the field and certainly my own personal views of, of human germline editing have really evolved since then because I think initially my thinking was it, it almost felt it felt gimmicky it felt like you know something that you know science you know s s some scientists might try to rush to do for publicity purposes but 
um, over the last few years, I've had an opportunity to meet with many, many people who have um, very, very generously shared their personal stories of, you know, grappling with genetic disease or sporadic genetic mutations that arise in their kids. And, um, and I've seen the, the just very, uh, you know, very, in a very raw way, the, the human need. And so I think that, you know, there, and, and the, the other thing that's happened, of course, is that, you know, the technology has advanced incredibly in, you know, and, and, and continues to do so. So, you know, just in the last few months, there have been studies done with, with human embryos that start to show how you could, in principle, use this kind of technology if you wanted to correct a disease-causing mutation in that sort of setting. And um, I think it's still very unclear, you know, exactly uh, when and how this, this, this will be utilized, for what purposes it will be most useful. I think that's still very much a question. Also, there's the whole issue of understanding the basics of human, very early human development. And I, I didn't, uh, you know, I wasn't, this isn't my field, so I didn't, I wasn't aware of this until I looked into it and heard from my colleagues that, in fact, with this kind of technology, you can now study the genetics of early human development in a way that you know is really, really enabling and opening up new, um, you know, really new avenues to understand her, uh, human uh, genetics and development. So um, these are all things that I think are, are, are both very, very important to continue to develop and, and also to really stay on top of the ethics of it because I think it has the potential to get out of hand, and I'd like to, I'd like to you know, hope that we can avoid that if possible. There's another paragraph here that caught my eye. You've seen all this before, you wrote it. Um, and you alluded to this in your talk, the importance of distinguishing between germline and non-germline applications. And yet when I talk to people, I find that that's a source of considerable confusion. And the knee-jerk reaction is just to assume it's all the dangerous or the controversial kind. And you wrote in here, after speaking about germline modification, there's just full alarm over, there is justifiable alarm over developments like these, yet we can't overlook the fantastic medical opportunities that gene editing gives us to assist people who suffer from debilitating genetic diseases. Imagine if someone who learned she carried the mutated copy of the Huntington gene, which virtually guarantees early onset dementia, had access to a CRISPR-based drug that could eliminate the DNA mutations before any symptoms appeared. Never before have curative treatments seemed so close, and it's essential that as we debate germline editing, we take care not to turn public opinion against CRISPR or obstruct clinical uses of gene editing that are not heritable. So can you just comment on that further? Well, I think the, um, and we talked about this a little bit earlier today with the students, um, but I think for me, uh, you know, one of my, one of my, um, one of the things I feel most uh, strongly about is exactly sort of that last sentence that you just read, which is namely trying to ensure that, uh, that there's a, a, an, a, an honest, transparent, and fact-based communication about CRISPR technology to people that are not scientifically trained so that they can understand both the, the power of this technology and at least enough about how it works so that they can start to make decisions about things that will come to affect them in the future, whether it's, uh, you know, do I want to use this uh, during my uh, in vitro fertilization, uh, you know, uh, procedures, or do I want to purchase food that has been um, edited using CRISPR, and uh, lots of other, you know, impacts in, I would say, you know, environmental settings, like using CRISPR to control the spread of mosquito-borne diseases and the potential risks that come with, along with that, but also the potentially very profoundly powerful and, and, and good benefit to human health globally. So these are the kinds of things that decisions that are going to come along, and I think we, we need an educated public so that they can work on those decisions together. I have a wonky science question for you. Great. So imagine a bacteria is being infected by a virus it's never seen before. How does it evade that infection, and how does the DNA end up in the CRISPR cluster? If it has a CRISPR array and it gets infected by a new virus, then you, know, you have to imagine what's actually happening right in this setting. So you've got you know, millions of bacterial cells that are all kind of you know, and they all have the same, essentially the same genome. 
And if they have a CRISPR system, all of those cells are given an opportunity to sample the viral DNA that's getting injected during the infection and grab a little piece of the viral sequence and stuff it into the, you know, store it in the CRISPR array. And what we think happens is that, first of all, is that most cells don't do that. So the integration system, the adaptation step, is actually not that efficient because it doesn't have to be, right? Because all we need is we need one or a few of those millions of cells to acquire a useful piece of DNA that's protective, and then they give rise to a whole new colony of bacteria. So it's not a very efficient system, but it's incredibly effective when it does happen because when they do grab a useful piece of DNA and store it, then the system works like I showed you. And we know that these, um, these, these surveillance proteins like Cas9 are incredibly good at finding DNA and cutting it up. That's what makes them good as tools, but it also makes them very effective as an immune system. I have one more question for you, and it's again from this afternoon, but it's a different audience. And that has to deal with oversight of this technology. And so we have various oversight mechanisms to deal with the proper and humane use of animals in research and teaching. We have oversight mechanisms for the use of stem cells. What's your vision of how oversight by government or other regulatory bodies will impact on this technology over, say, the next decade? Well, I sort of have two thoughts about that. One is that we're fortunate that back in the 1970s when restriction enzymes were first discovered and people were recognizing that now we had a tool that allowed pieces of DNA from one organism to be copied and replicated in a different organism. And so scientists were taking pieces of DNA from you know, all sorts of of, uh, of uh, contexts biologically and replicating them in bacteria. And there was concern initially that, you know, they were using the kind of bacteria that grow in the human gut. So the concern was, hmm, you know, would that create bacteria that are making uh, proteins or other molecules that are toxic or dangerous to humans and that would then somehow, you know, invade our, our bodies and, you know, cause problems. And so there were lots of discussion about this and that actually led to a whole infrastructure at the national level that regulates um, molecular biology and kind of in particular what we call, you know, molecular cloning. And fortunately, a lot of that infrastructure turns out to apply very nicely to the ways that people are deploying CRISPR-Cas9, especially for research purposes. And, um, and then the, the, uh, what happened with in vitro fertilization and all of the technology around um, you know, human fertility and, and, and sort of doing, uh, you know, being able to fertilize eggs in, in, in the laboratory. So all of the technology and regulation around that applies in the realm of, you know, using CRISPR-Cas9 in those systems. So I think we're, we're fortunate that we have already a nice infrastructure in place in the United States, and a lot of other countries follow that as well for governing this. But um, that being said, you know, there's, there's uh, you know, as I mentioned, this technology continues to develop very quickly. And so I think there is an ongoing need to be revisiting those regulatory guidelines to ask, are they sufficient? Do we need to have um, other or different regulations in place? How do we um, encourage, I don't, th I don't say enforce, because I think that's probably impossible, but how do we certainly encourage our, our international uh, neighbors and partners to respect those same guidelines? And uh, you know, how do we kind of uh, ensure that there's responsible use of these technologies going forward? And that's just gonna continue to be a very active area of, of discussion. Okay, on that note, on behalf of everybody here at Santa Barbara, I'd love to thank you for coming. It's been an honor to have you. Thank you, and thank you. And now for those of you who are wise enough to buy a copy of Jennifer's book, um, she'll be gracious enough to sign them and talk to everybody. Absolutely. Thank you everybody for coming.